But I want to say this. I want, I, want to re- I want to just encourage you to know that if you're going through things in the middle of, if you're going through things in your life and in the middle of a song service, if you've been crying out to God in your own personal time, you know, it's not a bad thing to come to the front and just worship the Lord up at the front. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to tell you to, that you need to do it. Oh, hey, everybody, come to the front so that it looks like that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am trying to say is, you know, listen, I went through some I went through a, a pretty troublesome time in my life whenever my sister took her life. Um, some a lot of you know that story. And uh, what happened was, was that I realized after that happened that I was a very mediocre Christian at best. My dad always used to use that word mediocrity. He's like, boy, don't be mediocre. Don't be mediocre, which just means half middle kind of thing. Not not really good. Not really bad. But I realized at that point in time, I was a mediocre Christian at best. And I can remember crying out from a broken heart saying, God, I need you to do something in my life. And God began to draw me by his spirit. And he would say, wake up early and seek me early and you shall find me and all these various things. And I got to be honest with you, something pretty amazing really happened in my life. That the first time I woke up in the morning, and I'll really never forget it. I get a little bit emotional when I think about it. But I can remember the first morning that I did wake up because the enemy fought me for a couple of months. And then finally I got up and it was about 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't even know how to worship the Lord. I didn't realize it, but I've been a Christian for 13 years. And I really did not know how to enter into worship. It's not that I went to churches that never worshiped because I did. I went to churches that worshiped God. And and it's not that I never experienced the presence of God. I'm just talking about at a personal level. And whenever I got up that morning, I can just remember thinking, Lord, this is what I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know where she is, but if she's with you, please love her for me like I never did. And when I prayed that prayer, it was like heaven opened up in a deluge of grace, just like a big old huge 55 gallon bucket of water just poured down on me and I'm telling you all of a sudden right before in in my mind's eye my whole life as a Christian began to flash before me and the Lord showed me so you know God can do things in your life that the preacher could sit up here and try to say with a thousand words and never accomplish one split second of God, right? Yeah. yeah. As hard as we try, as, yeah. as much as we pray and ask God to help us to do that. And what was flashing in front of my eyes was all, is this going to sound harsh to you, but all the failed attempts or all the failures of my life as a Christian, all the people that had that I had not reached because of the sin that had been in my life. And God gave me a word later, and I'm, one day I'll share that with you. I've shared it with you before. Well, no, you know what? I'm going to share it right now. Later, we started having a Bible study. We were going to Cornerstone at the time. We had the, and the youth ministry was coming to this Bible study. Aaron and I started this Bible study. We had 25, 30 kids sometimes. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this kid shows up. And I don't even know if he's serving God anymore, but I'm telling you right now, that boy, his name JP. Do wherever you are, if you happen to watch, you call by God. The Lord gave you a gift, and you're supposed to be prophesying for the Lord. But that's another story for another time. That dude showed up out of nowhere, and all of a sudden, in the middle of it all, he, put, he said, dude, I got to tell you something. He said, every now and then, God gives me. So he had just moved in from Texas. He said, God shows me something every now and then in my mind. And what I got was a vision, and it had to do with you. And he said that there was an old that he said there was a shrimp boat with two nets. And he said there were big holes in the nets of the butterfly nets. And he said that they went into the water and all these fish and shrimp were going through the holes that were in the nets. And I said, what does this mean, Lord? And the Lord said, you tell him that the holes in the net represent the sin that was in his life. This is consistent with the vision that the Lord gave me the morning that I woke up. All of these things that were passing through showed me all these failures that were in my life. But see, in that vision, that morning that God gave me, he was healing them as they were going by. Just as fast as the failures came by, God was healing them. I got a word for you this morning. I don't know how you failed the Lord, but I know you have because we're all human beings, but as fast as the failure, it comes to healing. Hallelujah. And he said, oh yes, thank you Jesus. And listen, all of a sudden, now the nets were on the deck of the boat, and there was an old man on the boat, and he was he was sewing up the holes, and he said, Lord, what does this mean? And he said, tell him that I am mending the nets. I am mending the nets. Listen, 
God wants you to know that no matter what you've been through in your life, no matter how far you've traveled, no matter how many bad things you've done, there's nothing impossible for God. And God's all about mending nets. He's all about sewing up holes. Hallelujah. But he's got a purpose for your life this morning. And the purpose is to heal you and to mend you so that you can be used for his glory. Hallelujah. Not for your glory. Come on, Christian. No, it's for his glory. And he will do a work in your life and you will be so grateful, just like this woman I'm going to talk to you about this morning. You will be so grateful when he does that work in your life that you ain't going to have nothing left that's going to be important upon this earth other than to bring him glory, other than to recognize that he is the one that was, that is, that is to come, that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that he is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth and he deserves all glory and honor. So with all that said, I was trying to encourage you if you're going through something in your life, because see, after I learned to seek God in my living room, one day I was sitting in that same church and I was in the back. And this is long after I used to be frustrated in my mind for Aaron. I told y'all that story before up at the front jumping and, so, and worshiping the Lord. I'm like, what's wrong with him? What's he so happy about? Because I was bound up. But you know what? The Lord, everybody else was distract everything was distracting me and the lord said well if you got a distraction then get up to the front and put your face and your focus on me like you do in your living room lately and it was so hard because it was almost like my hiney was stuck in my seat i couldn't get myself up but i knew the lord was prompting me to get up right and so when i did that the first thing that happened to me i was on my knees and i was worshiping the lord and you know what happened i'm telling you i know you're not supposed to hear the voice of your enemy but i'm telling you that wasn't the lord that i heard because you know what i heard it whispered in my ear was this. There's people in this place that think you're a fool. There's people in this place that think you're a fool. And all of a sudden, as fast as that came, came the word of the Lord. He said, they do think you're a fool. But I'm making you stronger than what they will ever know. I got, a good, I got an encouraging word for you this morning. To be a fool for Christ is to become strong yes. in Christ. Oh, to, to make yourself look foolish in the right. eyes of man, hallelujah, can also bring glory to the Lord. We're in, God ain't calling us to be flakes for Jesus, right. but he's calling us to be on fire for Jesus. Yes. And the real Holy Spirit, hallelujah, will do something on the inside of your life that will refine you and will get, bring you to a place that your life will bring glory and honor to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, I'm going to minister to you for a little bit this morning uh, about a message that I titled, Go On, Just Stand Up. Go on, just stand up. Stand up and be the person that God has called you to be. Amen? Let's take a look at Luke chapter 13, and we're going to read the story Verses 6 through 17. There's two kind of like stories. First, he starts off with a parable. And then it transitions into the story of a real woman that was ministered. Amen. Yeah, we want to be able to hear. Praise God. I'm just going to keep the mic right here. You know, I was sharing with, I think it was Robert this morning, our old preacher, whenever he used a handheld. See, we don't need it that loud. But I used to kind of like wave the mic around and never really. And, and I, I watched my old preacher when he, because he, we had a big old church and you had to have a microphone and keep that thing right there by his chin. What happened? Y'all turn me down? Yeah, uh, yeah. And anyway, he keep that chin. And you know what I realized why he did that? It looked kind of silly, but it was, you know what it was? He's like, if I'm going to hold a handheld, I got to have the mic by my mouth because people need to be able to hear. Anyway, praise God. We don't need it that long loud but here we go all right so listen it starts off with a parable <laughs> and then it's going to transition into a story but it's going to give us a common theme amen luke chapter 13 verses 6 through 17 he spoke also this parable a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and he sought fruit thereon. and when you see a fig tree you expect there to be figs but he found none then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, in other words, the person that took care of his fig vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. In other words, he's saying, please, Lord, I know you own 
this field. I know that this is your fig tree and you have multiple fig trees and all these other fig trees around here are producing figs and when you come looking for a fig, you find figs on those trees, but on this tree, you don't find figs. But please don't cut it down yet this year. Let me instead dig around it. Let me dung it. Okay, you know what a dung is. It's a pile of dung, right? That's fertilizer. Let me properly take care of this tree. Let me put it in an environment that will make it conducive for it to produce fruit for you. Mm. And if it bears fruit well, and if not, after that, then we shall cut it down. Now transitioning into verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath... And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, spirit of religion, lying spirit, doesn't want people to be set free, won't speak truth, won't do truth. If you're not going according to its traditions and you're not playing according to its own rules, it's going to call you down. It's going to tell you that you're doing it the wrong way. Doesn't really want people free. And what he did was he said this, he says, he answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. But that's the whole thing. Man didn't work right here. See, God did his work. Amen. Amen. In them, therefore, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, you hypocrite. See, everybody thinks Jesus is always so nice. <laughs> You know, but the reality of it is, is that Jesus had a real problem with a religious spirit. Jesus had a real problem with demon spirits and any kind of spirit that tried to hinder mankind. Right. Jesus always followed the rules of the Father. Hallelujah. Jesus always. But Jesus had a problem with lying spirits that tried to prevent people from truly being free. Amen. He says, you hypocrite does not each one of you, you too, sir, loose. He, what, he, what he said, lose his ox or his ass, another word for a donkey, right? Talking about a, a work animal from the stall and lead him away to watering. You did some work right there, sir, right? You release your animal so they can get some water. And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. Amen. And look at this. And the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing in your own life if you were witnessing for the Lord and people that come against you. And the Lord just give the right words to you. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just brings shame to those people that are coming against the gospel. Not just to vindicate you, but really to vindicate God and Amen. to vindicate the one that you preach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, this story of the woman is preceded by that parable about that fig tree, a fruitless fig tree. You know, the parable of this tree, it depicts how Jesus, how God expects for his kingdom on earth to operate. He expects fruit to be produced. Amen. But there's also the thought of showing mercy, waiting to see repentance. The vine dresser pleads with the owner that he would wait one more year. He knows that if the right environment of the soil is produced, whether it be fertilized or whatever the case, the tree will change and produce fruit. And real quick, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. See, I want you to know that that vine dresser, there's an owner of the field, right? He owns the fig trees. That's God, that's a representative of God the Father. The vine dresser represents Jesus. Amen. And he's pleading with the Father. But look what it says about Jesus and his nature. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That word, as, as men count slackness. You know what it's talking about right there? It, something must have happened to that TV. I don't know what's up. But anyway, 
the, as men count slackness, what it's talking about is laziness. It's talking about slow to move. Have you ever seen somebody slow to move on the job? You're thinking, man, Lord, I wish they put me on another crew because, man, I'm having to work double time just to try to pick up the slack for this old boy. That's what it's talking about right here. The, the, God is not slack or slow moving concerning the promises that he's made for mankind, but instead what he is is he's long-suffering. Right. That means that he has patience with people. I don't know if you have patience with people or not. I, sometimes I find that I don't have patience. But Jesus has been patient with you and I. He's not willing that any should perish, but that instead, God, Jesus' plan is that all would come to repentance. Amen? You know, the Lord is merciful. And he knows that if he waits a little bit longer and provides the right atmosphere... And, you know, sometimes that atmosphere, it's, it, it consists of trials and tribulations. Sometimes it consists of blessings that are disguised as trials and tribulations. You know, sometimes things happen in our life and we're like, why would God allow this to happen in my life right here at this moment in time? And then we look back three years later, four years later, and we're like, wow, because of that decision or that thing that happened in my life. Look where God brought me to. And look what's happened. God is truly in control of my life. Amen? And then Lord help us not to forget that tomorrow when we go through it again, right? Right, right. But whatever that atmosphere is, it's like adding fertilizer to the tree's soil. So is the preparation of the environment of the life to change and ultimately to produce fruit like it's supposed to do for God. This is his earth. This is his plan. He promised it in Genesis chapter 8 that, that until as long as the earth remains, there would be day and night, summer, winter, and seed time and harvest. Amen. God is looking for a harvest. Hallelujah. He's looking for fruit to be produced. And that's one of the most prolific or repetitive thoughts throughout the Bible is the fact that God's plan is likened to a field or a vineyard. And in the same way that spreading physical seed begins the process of new life, so is the spreading of God's word. Amen. The preaching of the gospel, the watering of that physical seed from rain provides an environment for growth. And the Holy Spirit, like water for the soul, gives life to the seed of God's word that has entered the heart. And ultimately, there's going to be a great harvest because God said, according to his word, that my word will not return unto me void, but that it will accomplish that which it was set forth to do. Sometimes you might feel like you're dormant in your walk with God, but I'm here to tell you, I am a personal testimony of the fact that sitting in churches for 13 years or more, and when the Lord turned that light on, after that circumstance I told you about this morning before we got started, I can remember going in a park with my nurse practitioner friend saying, dude, we need to have a Bible study. And all of a sudden I walked up in there and, all, and every, every, it seemed like everything that I had ever learned that I didn't even know was in there was like a well of water deep down in my belly and it started springing out. I'm talking about Paul and Silas in the midnight hour and the doors of the prison being opened up, hallelujah, and me being able to walk out, people getting saved. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just here to tell you that the word of God is getting down deep inside of your spirit, whether you realize it or not, it's in there. And the Lord's just waiting for the right yes. opportunity to pull it out so that he can give it to somebody else because God wants to produce fruit Amen. in your life and through your life. Psalm 24, 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The point that I'm trying to make with that is that this earth belongs to God. Yes. Everything upon this earth belongs to God. Yes. Hallelujah. And God's desire is that his people would produce fruit. Let's look at that. Titus chapter 3 verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that you affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Now he that plants and he that waters are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Revelation twenty two twelve says this. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according 
as his word shall be. This is the kind of church where we preach so hard to remind people that you're not saved according to your works. Amen. You're not, not only are you not saved according to your works, but you're not sanctified according to your right. works. Right. What does sanctification mean? It means to be set apart or to be made holy. You can read more Bible than everybody else in your school. You can read more Bible than everybody else in your workplace and even tell them about it, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, you ought to see how much Bible I read. You ought to know how much Bible I know. Watch me quote some scripture and show you everything that I know. You can be the one that reads the most, quotes the most, memorizes the most. You can be the one involved in every ministry in the church. You could pray hours in the day and call down fire from ahead. You can do all of these things. But if you think in your mind that you're making yourself more holy in the eyes of God because all the stuff you do, you're operating under a spirit of religion brothers and sisters. It's not your work that sets you free from the bondage of sin or cleans you up or purifies you. It's the work of Jesus and it's your faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you at the cross hallelujah that allows grace to flow in your life to strengthen you, to empower you, and to do the work on the inside of you. That's just good preaching right there because that's the word of the Lord. Amen. Because it reminds me that, that left to myself, I cannot accomplish what God needs accomplished. I'm weak. I'm incapable of doing what God is asking me to do. And I need his help. Amen. Amen. The father, the landowner, he looks down on this fig tree that produces no fruit and he wonders, what is the purpose of this tree in my vineyard? Why should the very ground that this tree exists within be cumbered? To cause a person or a thing to have no further efficiency, to de deprive of force. This fig tree right here that has no fruit on it is not only causing trouble for itself, it's causing trouble for my whole vineyard. Because you know why? It's soaking up all the nutrients and it's not doing anything with it. It's taking nutrients from the soil, it's taking water from the soil, and it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's a fig tree. It's supposed to produce figs. It's supposed to do what it was created to do. Christian, you're supposed to do what you were created to do. Christian on video, Christian in the sanctuary, preacher behind the pulpit, do you cover it the ground in which you are planted? Are you producing the fruit in which you were supposed to produce? What is the purpose of this tree in my vineyard? It just simply sits here in the soil and it leaches the nutrients, preventing the other trees around it from receiving what they need for growth. Don't you know that there's people in your life that you're around that need to know the Jesus that's planted deep inside your belly? Don't you know that there's people that you come into contact with on the day? I'm not trying to tell you. Listen to me. Don't walk out of here thinking, man, he, he preached a hard message. He put all kind of weight. He cumbered me. I feel like I'm bent over now like that poor woman in the story. I can't even stand up after that message. That's not what I'm here to preach to you. I'm here to tell you the good news that Jesus will set you free. Hallelujah. He will pick you up and he will give you the strength that you need in order to do what it is that he's called you to do if you want him to do it. That's right. There's people around you that are hurting. Amen. There's people around you that are dying. There's people that around you that need to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. If my sister would have never told me, I would have never known. Right. Amen. And how many people have you told before? I know you've told somebody before. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes you feel like you ought to be telling more. You know, in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, Jesus talks about the vine and the branch. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. He said, my father, basically, he, he does some, some purging because if there's a branch that doesn't produce fruit, he cuts it off and it gets burnt. But then the ones that do produce fruit, you know what he does? He prunes them. God will allow certain things again in our lives, amen, that cause a pruning to take place. Mm -hmm. Because there's certain things in our life sometimes that will try to allow the nutrients or the grace that God's trying to desire to wants to flow in our lives. It just gets in the way of things and it, and it, and it frustrates the grace of God in our life. And God wants to remove those things out of our lives so that he can accomplish in us what he wants to accomplish. He says 
if you will abide in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. But that apart from me, you can do nothing. The word abide means to live in a particular place. God wants you and I to live in a place called in Christ. Now, what, that, what are you talking about, preacher? I don't understand. It's a place of faith. It's a place that understands that Jesus died. I know he, he keeps seeing, saying the same thing again and again. Yep, because I'm going to keep on telling you the gospel. It's a place where the mind now has been trained on what to believe in. Not in how much ministry I'm involved in. Not in how much I read the word of God. Not in how much I pray. Not in how many times I go to church. But in the fact that Jesus died and set me free from the guilt and the power of sin. And because now that I'm clothed in Christ, hallelujah, the Father sees me as righteous and innocent. And he can now pour grace into my life. He can pour grace into my life and strengthen me. That's the place where I need to abide, a place of faith that continues to trust in Christ and what Jesus has done and not trust in myself. Amen? Amen. But the ground is cumbered. The fall of man has caused sin like thorns and thistles to grow rampantly in the soil of the earth. And what happens when I'm cumbered, Lord? You know, you, you, you're asking me to do all of these things. You, you desire for me to accomplish for you and to produce fruit for you. But what happens when I'm cumbered, Lord? When I know that I should repent and change. Come on, somebody. I know I'm preaching to somebody here this morning. <laughs> what happens when I know that I should repent and change, but I don't find the strength? Listen to me. Repent doesn't just mean... You know, I used to preach this all the time. I used to say it all the time because I thought it was funny. I don't know if it was funny or not, but it is what I used to think. There used to be a Britney Spears song. And in that Britney Spears song, she said, oops, I did it again. See, repentance isn't me like, oops, I did it again. And so, oh, I'm sorry, God, I messed up. I won't do that again. No, that's not repentance. Repentance means to change the mind. Yes. Listen, sometimes I can't do that on my own. Come on, somebody. I don't want to be preaching to a dead crowd this morning. I, sometimes there's things in my life that I know are not right with God. And the word repentance means to have a mind change. The word confession means to say the same. In other words, me and God come into unity. And I realize what his word says is true. That I was wrong. That he was right. And that I allow the Holy Ghost to change my mindset. And that I say, Lord, I will was wrong change me change my mind and move me in the right direction but sometimes I'm cumbered Lord and I can't do it because I do mean it when I say to you I'm sorry Lord come on I know I'm not just preaching to you this morning I'm preaching to myself Amen. There's things in all of our lives that we're like, Lord, I know that this area of my life is not lining up with your will for me. Lord, but I'm cumbered and I don't have the strength in me that I need. I want to grow, I want to work, I want to produce fruit in your kingdom, but I'm all bent over and I'm crooked. See, that's what the word says for the woman. She was bowed over. She was yeah. bent over and she was crooked. She's walking like this for 18 years, folks. And there's a, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but there's a guy in town like that. It, I mean, it's sad. I've seen it before. You've probably seen it. He can't stand up. I've seen a couple people like that. Some kind of spinal stenosis or something going on in their vertebra. And they're walking around. I mean, just think about it. I mean, like, you know, you want to tell somebody, man, lift your head up, dude. Lift your head up. Quit looking down at the ground all the time. You're looking sad all the time. Come on. No, I can't. I ain't got no strength. I'm all bowed over. I'm crooked. I'm bent. And I can't stand up. That's what my message is. Just stand up. Go on. That's what I want to tell this woman. That's one of my points. But I want to tell her, just stand up. You can't. I'm cumbered. Mm -hmm. I don't have no strength. I'm crooked. And I'm bent yeah. over. I need some help. Yeah. God would say, trust me, I have a plan for that. I got a plan for your bent over and your crookedness and your bowed upness. I got a plan for that. Y'all twist it up, but I got a plan for that. I have a, font, a vine dresser and he takes care of all my vineyard. He pleads for you. He's at my right hand and he intercedes for you. He believes that you will produce fruit and he mediates for you. And he says to me just a little longer. Let me care for the tree. Let me fertilize it or provide an environment 
where it can grow. You know, one of the first things, that's what I say, it says, so what has you been over in crooked? Now, I would ask you that this morning. What has you been over in crooked in your life? I'm going to say it one more time, two more times, three more times, so that you don't forget whenever you leave here today, so that the preacher will remind himself also. What is it, preacher? What is it, ma'am, sir, that has you been over in crooked? You fill in your own blank. I don't need to even start listing them all out like I do sometimes, because something somewhere will try to get us bent over and crooked. Sometimes it's blatant sin that we know what the Word of God says, but sometimes it's just mindsets. Sometimes it's attitudes towards other people. We look down them up from our religious perspective. We look down them from what, and look, man, I used to have the biggest problem with the way people, certain people dressed. I'm just being honest with you. Why did I focus more on the way people dressed? Like, man, they ain't got no fashion. You know, what, what is going on? Or whatever it was that was going on, I was so, like, focused on what everybody looked like. Lord, help me. The, the mindsets is what I'm trying to talk about right now. A mindset about that kind of thing can get you bent over and crooked because now you can't see the pain and the heartache right. and the sorrow that's on the inside of that person's life and how bad they need Jesus. And instead we're just so caught up in what the world says and all this other kind of stuff. There was a woman and she had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and she was bowed together, bent over and crooked. She was plagued by an infirmity and she couldn't move. The word infirmity literally means weakness. She was lacking strength to move right. Last night, Devin gave his testimony at the youth ministry. And one of the things that he said that I heard what had to do with being stuck. He might not even remember saying that, but I was already in my message. And I was like, see, she was stuck. She was stuck in a spot and she couldn't move. Have you ever felt like you were stuck in a spot and you couldn't move and you're asking God, please, Lord, I need strength yes. in order to be able to move. She can't go where she needs to or do what she needs to do. See, when people are affected in this way spiritually, it affects everything in their lives. I'm telling you right now, it will affect every aspect of your life. It will affect your work. It will affect your relationships. It will affect your families. What is in your life, what is in my life that has us in a place that affects our life negatively in these areas? It doesn't matter what it is. The Lord can and will deliver you from it because he wants to produce fruit in the midst of your life. He wants to produce fruit in your home so that your children can see what it's supposed to look like to be a man or a woman of God. He wants to produce fruit in your life so that the people that you work with will see that you are the most loyal, that you are the hardest working, that you're the one that's going to make sure that they ain't got to pick up the slack, but that instead you're there to help pick up the slack so that, and they're like, why does he do that? Because I'm not here to cover the ground, man. I'm here to produce for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's who I work for, brothers and sisters. Amen. And if I'll work for him, hallelujah, I'm going to be blessing everybody around me in one way, shape, or form. Amen. And the Lord's going to use all them trials and tribulations about the way people treat me. If they take advantage of me, let this, put it in the Lord's hands. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be mature in Christ. I'm going to trust God. Hallelujah. And as I do that, he's going to grow me. He's going to strengthen me. He's going to teach me. Amen. And I'm going to start to produce some fruit in my life. And along the way, guess what? He might even bless my pocketbook. He, and guess what else? He might even sew up some holes in my pocket. Because one thing I've learned is, is that, guess what? The Lord has poured a whole lot of blessing in my life. Sometimes, though, I need him to sew some holes, sew up the holes in my pocket. Because I don't know how to handle the 90% he gave me. But I'm starting to learn, Lord, sew them holes up in my pocket. Because I'm working way too hard to let that stuff just keep flowing yeah. out, right? Yeah. Yes, Lord, let my money work for me instead of me working for my money. That's another story for another time. Listen, but whatever it is that's got you bent over and crooked, got me bent over and crooked, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Whatever it is, it's a weight or a sin that's, that's slowing you down. It's messing you up. He said right here, the author of Hebrews, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. 
He's just listed off a whole list of witnesses that lived for God in the Old Testament. And it's a reminder to you and I that you're not the first one. Did you know that, Christian? If you're a true Christian, do you understand something? It all starts with you accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know that, right? But do you realize that if you're a true Christian, that when you got saved and prayed that prayer, that the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart? And do you realize at that moment in time, whether you realize it or not, you became different than the world around you? And do you realize whether you, real, whether you knew it or not, that God expects that you would change? Hallelujah. And that he doesn't want you to stay the same fruitless tree that you might have been before, but that instead he expects that you're going to produce fruit. People in the modern church don't like this kind of preaching. Oh, no, 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 no. I want a Jesus. I want to go to heaven, but I also want to be able to do what I want to do. It don't work that way, brothers and sisters. It doesn't work that way because the same spirit that penned the words in the book that we read is the same spirit that lives on the inside of your heart. And you can resist that spirit and that voice long enough to where you don't hear it anymore. But I'm here to tell you, it's still screaming from the pages of the book. The word of God is still preaching. The message is still going out, even if we are trying to turn off our receiver. Right. Don't want to hear that no more. Click, turn you off. No, it doesn't work that way. The word of the Lord is still going forward. So the Lord, he says like, he says this, there's a great cloud of witnesses. And they speak of people that endure. They speak of people that lived a life of, for God. Amen. And because of that, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, what is the race that is set before you? <laughs> Let me just say this. You don't have to turn there on the screen, but Ephesians chapter 2 is a scripture that I use a lot. You know what it says? It says there's a spirit from the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, and that he's causing the people of the world to go in a certain direction. It's a course that you and I also used to run before we became Christians. But let me tell you something. When you got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live in your life, guess what? There was a course direction. It's kind of like a GPS. Correcting direction. Correcting direction. Rerouting your, your position. And whenever the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart, that's what he's doing. He's rerouting the position. He's rerouting the direction to send you on a race. But you know what the word beset means? It means to throw you off course. So whatever they are, whether they're sins or weights, whatever a weight is, some kind of encumbrance, some kind of weight. I mean, can you imagine? Listen, it's one thing to wear if you're training for a race. It's one thing to wear a weighted vest when you're training for a, a running race. But you're not going to put that vest on if you're actually trying to win the race. So whatever those things are, you're going to have to plug in your own blanks. Whether they're specific sins in our lives, whether they're mindsets in our brain, whatever it is. You let the Holy Ghost tell you what it is and you fill it in and you be reminded of yourself. That thing is what might have me bent over, bowed over and incapable in, in of doing what it is that God's called me to do. But he's called me to run a race. Hallelujah. And so I need to get this thing out of my life. The second thing I saw was this. She could not pick herself up. In no wise could she lift up herself. She didn't have the power to pick herself up. And I don't know about you, but I want to say, like I told you earlier, that's the title of my message. Just stand up. I mean, if you ever saw this, this, these people that I've seen, two different people, one in home and one over here. And that whenever they're walking like that, I'm telling you, like, that's what I'm thinking in my head. Just stand up. Come on. Make, you know, next time, man, I need to stop and pray for that, brother. Just stand up, brother. You can do it. But, but she couldn't just stand up. Don't you think she would have if she could have? She can't just stand up. She's hurting. She's bound up. And she doesn't have the strength that she needs to go to the places that God has for her. But God has a plan to provide strength to those that are weak. Amen. Aren't you glad this morning that if you are bent over, if you are crooked, God doesn't expect you to, to pick yourself up. No, instead, he's provided a plan that gives you strength and grace in order to allow him to pick you up. And listen to me, the devil wants to keep you in a rut. 
The devil wants to keep you bent over where all you see is the ground upon which you're walking on. He never wants to allow you to be able to look up to the Lord. Amen. He wants to keep you in the valley to where you can't see from the mountaintop. I'm here to tell you this morning that the God that you serve is big enough and great enough to pick you up, to straighten you up, and to give you the strength that you need in order to walk right with the Lord. You know, some of the times our problem, you know what our problem is sometimes? We like where we are. It's a common ground. I'm used to this little plot of ground right here. I don't mind looking at it. I'm used to it. And this is where I want to stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about sometimes it's just, yeah, sometimes it can be sins that make our flesh feel good. I mean, we've all been there, right? I mean, why do you think people do drugs that ruin their life? Why do you think people drink enough alcohol to change the, the way that they feel? Because they like the way that that's, that makes them feel. I liked the way that made me feel. That's why, until it started causing more pain than fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then whenever it starts causing more pain than fun, then I start saying, whoa, Lord, help me out here. But sometimes the Lord God say, this is what you want. I'm going to let you have it till you're convinced that that's not really what you want anymore. Right? But sometimes it's just, again, it's, it's mindsets and it's ways of our thinking, ways that we've been living. I'm used to this. You know, you know for whatever reason, I, I realize now that I used to like to gossip. Like, just like a little, I'm not making fun of teenage girls, but I'm just saying. I used to like to gossip like a teenage girl. I probably told people's business more than a teenage girl. <laughs> and I realize now, looking back on it, that, that may, it's, it was something like it was it's weird it's kind of like my flesh likes it i like to talk about it that's why we do it and whether it's that or some other kind of mindset sometimes like if you do me dirty i like to lose my temper it makes me feel good it makes me feel good to be able to have a string of words that come out that just sound so eloquent and smart and make you look so dumb <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I just love it, man. Oh, I, and boy, look, whenever I can speak down to you and condescend to you and make you feel like that big, and now I feel all big and bad. Look at what I just did to you just with some words. We ain't got into the physical stuff yet, buddy. And I'm just saying, like, sometimes I, I like living where I live, man. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel what I, no, no, no. The Lord... She couldn't pick herself up, but the Lord wants to pick us up. Amen. And I got good news for you. He wants to give us strength. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. If you don't feel like you can do it because you've been living there for a long time, I'm here to tell you, hallelujah, he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases their strength. And he can do all of that because of what Jesus has already done. Every time you find words like this in the Old Testament, you got to understand that in the New Testament, God the Father sent Jesus the Son to die on the cross. And all of this is available to you and I because of what Jesus has already done. He said, it is finished. Hallelujah. The work is complete. And now I just need the grace of the Holy Ghost to flow in my life. And I need for me to surrender to God's will and line up according to his word. Amen. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You and I were sinners and we had no strength to save ourselves, but God sent Jesus, his son, to die in our place again so that we could have access to his presence, access to his grace. You have no strength. You're bent over and you're crooked, but I got a plan. Amen. To set you free. See, sin is more powerful than a person's will. Sin cripples people and renders them incapable of moving forward. But Jesus is the answer for our weakness. He died so that God's grace could give us strength. This is my last little point that I'm seeing here. As a matter of fact, Naya, Manny, whoever wants to come back and play us a song, I want you to come up here. And this is the last thing I want you to know this morning because it's the same word he had for her that he has for us. He loosed her. He said, woman, you are loosed from this infirmity. Now, I got to tell you, he said, you are loosed from your infirmity. And immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. He sent it away. That's what the word loosed means. Really, it's a word that sometimes it describes the word divorce. As a matter of fact, if you look this word up in the Greek, on multiple occasions, it's utilized to describe divorce. That's what the word means. It means to be separated from. You know what the Lord would say in this situation? The Lord would say in this situation, this is not a marriage made in heaven. 
you being bowed over, crippled up, and without strength, and incapable of producing fruit, and going to the places that I have for you is not a marriage made in heaven. This thing being connected to you is not my will for your life. I'm going to release you from this. I'm going to allow this you to be divorced from this thing. You know what I'm talking about this morning? I'm not telling you that it's okay to divorce your spouse. That's not what I'm preaching here this morning. What I'm talking about right here, right now, is that sometimes there can be things in our life that hold us back from God for so long. Strongholds in our life that hold us back from God for so long that we almost begin to think that we are married to it. We almost begin to think that we're one flesh with it. And we don't even know how in the world we're going to get free from it. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord said, you are loosed from this infirmity. He sent it away. Amen. Two things happened when Jesus loosed her from this infirmity. Number one, she was made straight. She stood up. She stood up straight for the first time in 18 years. The effects of this thing in her life, its grip over her, it was reversed. That's good news. Amen. That's good news this morning. It was reversed in her, and those things can be reversed in our lives. God can heal and restore. You might be watching my video this morning, and you might think, what in the world? How can God heal all of this pain, all of this? Like It's almost like 9-11. Remember when that big old pile of rubble? This is Brother Larson's. Oh, by the way, Brother Larson's coming October 17th and 18th. Brother Larson's uh, illustration that this big old huge pile of rubble, how will this ever be cleaned up? But there were little trucks at the bottom of the screen, in and out, in and out, in and out, picking up a load, taking it out. Sometimes the, the tragedy of our lives is so big, the debris is so big, we don't understand how will God ever fix this. You got to just trust him every day, child of God. Come on, Christian. You just got to get up the next day and keep trusting God. We want him to fix it all at one time, but guess what? It was, the mess wasn't created. Well, in that case, it was. Maybe. We won't get into that. But you know, most times, the messes in our life weren't created in one day. And we want them, oh, no, you got to. The Lord would say, no, you got to trust me. Trust me every day. And I'm going to bring healing. So she was made straight. And the effects of, it, of its grip were reversed. The second thing was she glorified God. In her freedom, all she wanted to do was to give glory to God. Amen. All she wanted to do was to give glory to God. Maybe you've been going through something in your life. And maybe you say to yourself, I want to give glory to God. But listen to me. you got to keep trusting God. Amen. And along the way, he will reverse the grip of that thing in your life. And he will put a desire in your heart to give glory to God.